AM radio, an op-ed column, and Fox News is not enough. I want a center-right nation to fight for its soul, and its soul is represented in the arts. Its soul is represented in, in a world in which media is everything. AM radio is the lowest form of communication. It's tinny. It's not robust. It's not avatar. I want avatar. I want the right to enter the world of media to the extent and invest in media the way that the left does. The fake media is trying to silence us, but we will not let them because the people know the truth. The fake media tried to stop us from going to the White House, but I'm president and they're not. You're listening to the Kurt Schilling Podcast, a Breitbart.com podcast. The podcast starts now. Here's Kurt with today's headlines. Hey guys, welcome to another edition of the Kurt Schilling Podcast. Got a great show lined up for you today, so we're going to get right to it. Kelly Shackelford, President and CEO of the First Liberty Institute, will be joining us. You're not going to want to miss some of the stories around uh, what's happening inside of our military with religious liberty. But our leadoff hitter today is going to be the one and the only Dinesh D'Souza. His movie, The Death of a Nation, it, it red carpeted last night in D.C. August 3rd, you're going to be able to see it, and you're not going to want to miss it. Death of a Nation, the movie.com is where you can check it out. But we're going to kick off today as we do each day with sound bites to show what is happening in the real world and the unhinged left and their continued uh, scramble. The unhinged left, which facilitated the attempted assassination of Republican politicians on a softball field, pushed the hands up, don't shoot narrative to the point where Black Lives Matter was assassinating police officers. Uh, and all sorts of other uh, anti-Trump violence. Got a little bit of its own last night, and, and they got it in the way conservatives give it, which is peaceful protest. On uh, uh, Wednesday, uh, SE Cup unfiltered. She was speaking with Jim Acosta, who has turned into the biggest glory hound camera whore ever. Uh, also, he's a giant puss. But listen to him talk about uh, his, his uh, experience at the Trump rally from Trump supporters in Tampa, Florida. Honestly, it felt like we weren't in America anymore. Uh, I, I don't know how to put it uh, any more plainly than that. Uh, Americans should not be treating their fellow Americans in this way. Uh, but unfortunately, what we've seen, and this has been building for some time since the campaign, I've been, I've been talking about this as an issue since the campaign, when the president uh, during the campaign referred to us as the dishonest media, the disgusting news media, liar, scum, and thieves, and so on, and then he rolled that right into uh, the office and started calling us fake news and the enemy of the people, uh, he is whipping these crowds up into a frenzy uh, to the point where they, they really want to come after us. And, we, you know, we have these these bike rack uh, like barriers around the press cage, as we call it, uh, to protect us essentially from people who might take things too far. It's unfortunate because, and I try to calmly talk to a lot of these folks at the rally last night to say, listen, hey, you know, tell me what you want to talk about here. Why are you guys so upset with us? And they would kind of go through a list of questions. Uh, most, of, most of the questions were about, why don't you guys report positive news about the president? And I said, hey, you know what, we do that. Yeah. Uh, we were reporting on this positive job numbers in the economy last Friday. And my, my sense of it, Essie, is that, the, that these opinions that these folks have at these rallies, they're shaped by what they see in the primetime hours of Fox News and what they hear from some conservative news outlets that just sort of give them this uh, daily diet of what they consider to be terrible things that we do over here uh, at CNN. It's mm. very unfortunate, but it's, it's, it's a pitting of American against American, yeah. and honestly, it needs to stop. Boo effing who? My God. And, and the, the fact of the matter is the people are being whipped into a frenzy, and the people are being uh, incited because of the things you're doing. Don't blame somebody else. They, you guys are, 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 have made your own bed. You felt like I was not in America. Well, the fact of the matter is, it should have felt like you were in exactly in America because peaceful protest is one of the things we're allowed to do here. That's how it works. If that would have been the other way around, there would have been uh, you would have been hit by an egg or maced or whatever. But the fact of the matter is, this guy is a clown and a joke. But that just leads to uh, to uh, further discussion around how far off the rails the left has gone. I want you to listen to Rob Reiner, who, by the way, 
uh, when he was on Fox, and I think he was on or Tucker, uh, he didn't have the guts to back up any of the things he says uh, from a um, you know a Twitter perspective. He's one of those Twitter tough guys, talking about uh, all of the uh, the misinformation, and these people have the gall to call other people liars. They, they they've done nothing but but bullshit you for two years uh, on MSNBC. Rob Reiner, listen up. Donald Trump ran on this, and it, and it was effective. He said that, you know, the media doesn't represent regular people. Hollywood doesn't re represent regular people. We are completely out of touch with regular people. And it worked to his advantage. How do you, how as somebody who, who speaks in the media often, as someone who produces films like Shock and Awe that are, that are journalism films, but then also somebody in Hollywood, how do you push back on that? You just have to keep pounding away. There, there's nothing else you can do. I mean, look. He doesn't speak to the mainstream media. Uh, they, they, they're just angry. Their people are angry, and he will feed them whatever they want to keep that anger going. And you see it in the rallies. He actually calls for, you know, this kind of outrage to, and take it out against the media, take it out against immigrants, take it out against whomever you want. That's what he does. He keeps stirring this up. But we, you have to stay at it. You have to stay at it. There's no other way. Bring the fact-checking up to 11. Well, if you can. I mean, if you can. If you don't break through, we are going to have, uh, we are in it right now. It might be the last stage of a civil war. The last battle is being fought. Hopefully it won't be fought physically. But we are more divided than we ever have been. And we've got a president who is backed up by media. The presidents have always uh, spewed propaganda. Liberals, Democrats, yeah. Republicans, they always have. Everyone spins. Yeah, to push a policy, to push uh, a rationale to go to war, but they've never been backed up by essentially incensed state-run media. That's new. And, and, and social media, it's all new. And uh, it's very, very scary right now. Boo-hoo. Again, when you listen to them, they scream about the very thing they're guilty of. A state-run media? I mean, if, if you've, uh, the body of work the left has produced in the last 18 months is some of the worst propaganda in, in American political history. Peaceful protests. That the, this is, again, the left accusing the right of the thing that they're doing. All of the violence was at the Trump rallies, and it was against Trump supporters. It wasn't Trump supporters creating violence. And you notice how he talks about, and they all do it, Trump's against immigrants and blood, but he never mentions that they never used the, and they don't mention the word illegal, illegal immigrants. We're against illegal immigrants and, you know, we're for law abiding citizens. And apparently that's taboo on the left. And then on Wednesday's broadcast, MSNBC, uh, Morning Joe, George Washington University law professor Jonathan Turley listened to his quote, I don't think the ball has moved materially closer and translated that to mean the left still has not one ounce of evidence. So listen up to, to what he has to say. Well, I think that we have to be honest that the, a victory in the Manafort trial is not necessarily a big victory for the investigation per se. It is not connected to the campaign. It's a conventional prosecution. doesn't mean that he's innocent. doesn't mean he shouldn't have been prosecuted. But it doesn't say that much about the investigation. In terms of obstruction and um, collusion, I don't think the ball has moved materially closer to Trump. I think the great, greatest dangers remain, as I've said before, on the margins, on the borders, coming from McDougal and Daniels controversies, coming from the risk that Donald Trump Jr. could be in if anyone supports any of these accounts. Um, those have always, in my view, been the existential threats. Uh, and so I think what, what I'm looking at primarily is not a direct hit on obstruction or collusion, but whether some of these collateral and, and issues way, are going to move say, closer. When you say collusion, you, you, cons a conspiracy, right? You're talking about a, a conspiracy. Right, but what they really need to show for collusion, and maybe Mueller has something like this, would be a quid pro quo, any type of uh, wink, wink, nod, nod agreement with the Russians that, uh, for example, there might be some change on sanctions if they help on the elections. That's the type of evidence that would materially change the situation. And, and right now, your biggest concerns, if you were uh, in the Trump orbit, would be with Don Jr., uh, would you put Roger Stone in that group? Who else would you put in the group of who, who you would think might be in greatest legal strategy, uh, le well, legal I uh, danger? 
I think there's two dangers. One is that these collateral investigations could come very close to the White House. I think they've moved closer. But the other great danger is Trump's response to something like mm -hmm. an investigation or indictment of his son. That creates a great unpredictability uh, for the uh, team as to how he might respond. He could very well respond as a parent instead of a president. He could, he could issue a bunch of firings and pardons. So this thing could really change and turn on a dime. And I think everyone is watching that closely. But I think that where I would be looking as a criminal defense attorney is on the edges. What I got from that is they have nothing, we have nothing, and there is nothing going on. The potential risk to Trump Jr., uh, the existential threats. I mean, Karen McDougal and Stormy Daniels, incredibly horrible decisions if the president did those things, which I have no reason to, to, to not believe they happened based on the way things happened. But uh, in terms of obstruction and collusion, I don't think the ball – has moved materially closer to Trump, which, again, is, is lawyer speak for nothing happened. And did you notice Morning Joe trying to correct him by saying, when you say collusion, you actually mean conspiracy. No, he meant collusion. Nice try, though. Uh, the effort is, is got to applaud him for the effort because they're given uh, everything they can to make this happen. Yesterday, Rush Limbaugh, 30 years. Uh, which a lot of people, I can remember listening to Rush Limbaugh a long time ago. He paved the way for the Hannity's of the world and for the Tucker Carlson's of the world and for the, the CRTV's and the Mark Levin's of the world. He got a little surprise phone call. I thought it was kind of cool. Listen up. Rush, I just wanted to congratulate you on 30 years. This is your favorite president, and I think you are fantastic. And I heard about it, and today is the big day, 30 years. I wanted to call personally and congratulate you. I am floored. I, <laughs> I thought there was nothing anybody could do to surprise me today. I've been preparing for anything. Mr. Uh, you President— know, You're a very special man, Rush, and you have people that love you. I'm one of them. But you're a very, very special guy. What you do for this country, people have no idea how important your voice is. So I just wanted to personally make this one, and I said I'll even dial the number myself if I have to. But uh, I just want to congratulate you. 30 years in that tough business is incredible. And well, you're stronger now than ever before. Well, I, I thank you so much. It's such a thrill to hear from you. You know, people don't realize what a great achievement 30 years is and that cutthroat business that you happen to be in. You know, you might not find that because you're so good at what you do, but that is a cutthroat business. And for you to do this for 30 years is truly an amazing accomplishment. And there's no voice like it. And uh, your fr even your friend Hannity agrees with that. He said, there's nobody like this man. <laughs> so I said, oh, gee, I guess I thought you two would be competitive. He said, nope, he's the dean. No way. He called you the dean. No way. He was a so, guest host. That, 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 he guest hosted for me when we first started. That's uh, no, he's, he's great. And he's a big, he's a tremendous fan of yours. They all are. Everybody is. So I just want to congratulate you 30 years of uh, – and just do it for another 30 years. After that, you can take it easy, okay? I will do that. Just – I'll stay around as long as you do. Okay, you have a deal. He paved the way. I don't know if he's bigger now than he's ever been, but I think he has much more of a presence now. Remember how hard the left worked to destroy this guy. And speaking of Hannity, Hannity follows up. Listen to him talk about uh, Rush as well. You know what? It is a competitive business, but people like myself – the great one, Mark Levin, Laura Ingram, and most people that work in talk radio, we all understand that he forged a path for all of us. Here's the big question, though. I personally, you think back of the last 30 years, think about America today without Russia's voice, that booming conservative voice for 30 years, his unwavering commitment to conservative ideology, philosophy, frankly, his wonderful, warm sense of humor, his outrageous humor, his steadfast love of country. He's literally given this country insightful commentary decade after decade, and it has changed the media landscape in this country forever. As he, he led the way, forging a path, like earlier pioneers like Jerry Williams and and Barry Farber, Bob Grant, all these guys, some outrageous, controversial, some not. We get to do what we do today because he single-handedly opened up a whole new marketplace. He had the courage of his convictions. He paved the way for a new media and a political revolution. And the fact, for example, you're watching me right now is in part because of these great pioneers courageously forging that path. 
He had the audacity to stand up versus the status quo. He took a lot of heat. He stood for honest, conservative, great American values. They have tried again and again to take him down, and they take it just like they try to take Mark, Laura, me down whenever they can. But here we are. We're blessed, and we're better off as a country. The media has some diversity because of his life's work. So Rush, on behalf of me, Mark, Laura, conservatives everywhere, millions of us, thank you. Congratulations. 30 great years of broadcast excellence. And I'll back it up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, without Rush, I'm not sure if I would have been able to do these things after I retired, but uh, I'm certainly appreciative. And he has always been a very loud, booming voice. Uh, I, he, he, I think he freaked out the establishment when he first came on, being as smart as he was about the things he was smart about. So, Coming up next, guys, Dinesh D'Souza, his movie Death of a Nation, red carpeted last night, and it will uh, premiere August 3rd. Breitbart News Daily with Alex Marlowe. Why did we see some of the Republican kissing of Mark Zuckerberg that was taking place. I called it kissing the ring because I felt like every single person practically had to kiss the ring of this guy, you know, who wants to do nothing except get all those people out of office. So, you know, bizarre, bizarre behavior from the Republicans. Breitbart News Daily, weekdays at 6 a.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Patriot 125. You're listening to the Kurt Schilling Podcast. Once again, here's Kurt Schilling. I've had him on before. I'm always honored to get a, a minute of this gentleman's time. He's been incredibly busy doing God's work here. He is a man of fact. He is a man of uh, hard work and research. I would argue that you could give him the title investigative reporter, given what he's done and the news he's exposed and the things that he's done. He is the one and only Dinesh D'Souza. Good morning, sir. How are you? Uh, good morning. Great to be on the show. All right. Listen, the trailer's got me fired up a little bit, Dinesh. The movie's called A Death of a Nation. I know you guys had the premiere, and uh, it opens August 3rd. First thing I'd ask you is just kind of give people a, kind of a top-down view of what you were trying to accomplish with this movie. Well, the movie uh, Death of a Nation, and I have a, a book of the same title that is out this week, uh, it focuses on two big issues. The first one is fascism, and the other one is racism or white supremacy. Now, these are the two kind of incendiary charges that have been flung against Trump, uh, but not just against Trump, also against conservatives and Republicans. And what I do in this movie is I actually go to the root of the matter and I show that the racist and the fascist tail uh, do not belong on the Republican elephant, but rather on the Democratic donkey. So this is a, uh, a film that blows the lid on racism and fascism and exposes the racist and fascist ideology and tactics of the left. But, and this is what you did, was it Hillary's America? I mean, it, 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 it's, the fact of the matter is, this is what you do. And I, I say, I've, I've actually, you know, I've tagged you a couple times, I don't know if you've seen it last week, I'm, I'm having a debate with liberals about just fundamental history. There's a belief, you know, this whole the party switch thing, which you disproved many times before. I went back and did a couple days of research, and I found that it was very easy to figure out where the lie was inserted and how it was inserted. And I, I'm sad to say that part of it is just straight ignorance. People that are, they choose not to get educated or they're miseducated. And I'm seeing more and more and more of that when it comes to fundamental history lessons. And I'm assuming that this is going to be the very same thing uh, in Death of a Nation, which, like you just said, you go back and you say, okay, well, and I'm one of those people, Dinesh. I, I, I have never said, I don't have a racist bone in my body, and I've never said anything that could be remotely construed as racist. There's no tweets in my closet or any of those things. Yet the left has been able to, quote unquote, dismiss me uh, as a racist just offhand because of things that have been written about me that aren't true. Well, you know, the thing is, it's really funny because some of the left wing reviews of the movie so far and the book, they're saying, well, Dinesh is doing revisionist history. And the truth of the matter is I am actually revising progressive revisionist history. And, and what I mean by that is that come the, starting in the 1940s, but really continuing through the 60s, the progressives who came to power in academia and the media uh, recognized that the Democratic Party had a deep racist history, recognized that the Democratic Party was to some degree in bed 
with fascism in the 20s and 30s. They praised Mussolini. Some of them even praised Hitler. They knew all this. But they also knew that if the American people found out about it and subsequent generations found out about it, the progressives and the Democrats would be discredited. And so this began progressive revisionism, the whitewashing of history to clean up the record, to remove the socialism out of national socialism, to move fascism from the left wing column into the right wing column. So all I'm doing is blowing the whistle, taking the lid off of this intellectual and moral scam. And for this, I'm being accused of being a revisionist. First of all, it's, uh, guys, the movie's called The Death of a Nation. Uh, the book, uh, uh, the movie comes out August 3rd. The book is out. You can pre-order on Amazon.com, any place. Well, before Amazon.com, search engine tries to bury it, you can order it there. Otherwise, you can find it at uh, other places that sell truth. And Let me ask you this. You, you, you talked about, I want to know, because I, listen, military history is my passion, and I, I understand it. I know it uh, going back as far as you can go. I want to know how the left managed to hijack fascism and socialism. I mean, Mussolini was the first fascist, and (laughs) there wasn't anyone more left-leaning than Benito Mussolini other than Adolf Hitler. But the left has managed to turn that into – it's the party of opposites. When you look at what they're screaming about, generally they're guilty of the very thing they're yelling about. We have a a riveting scene in the movie in which we simply scroll on the screen – uh, the Nazi 25-point platform. So the Nazis campaigned. They were successful. They were the largest elected political party in Germany in 1933 when Hitler became chancellor. And so you begin to see, what do they stand for? And it turns out they stand for state-controlled health care, state-controlled banking, state control of education, state control of the churches and, and religious liberty. And down the list you go, and suddenly you realize that it's very obvious when you look at the actual Nazi agenda that no one, no one in their right mind could call this a conservative or right-wing agenda. It is manifestly a left-wing program. In fact, it sounds eerily similar to things that the democratic socialists are saying today. Exactly right. And, and not only is it left-leaning, but I would argue that those 25 points are the foundation of the left. That's what the that that's who and what the left is before the American left could could identify itself and people well and and you know I I find it ironic that the uh, that Planned Parenthood and the left uh, and the Party of Women celebrates Margaret Sanger whose eugenic policy to get rid of undesirables was one of the blueprints for Hitler's final solution and he they they actually mention her as someone who provided them with part of their program. And and all of that stuff has been foisted on you and I, as if, uh, I mean, my God, Dinesh, you've been called an anti-Semite and a, a, a racist. And, and I, I, look, I look at what you do and say, uh, and then where I get worried, Dinesh, is, is when I look back at your personal history and the fact that you were jailed for the thing you were jailed for, which, by the way, allows the left to just dismiss you as a felon offhand, which I find to be very amusing. But I'm sure you don't because it affected your personal life. As we're learning, the government, the Department of Justice, all of these entities can destroy your life even if you've done nothing wrong. And, and I wonder, is, is that not something you kind of live with the fear of now, given what they've done to you in the past and what you've been subjected to in the past? First of all, you know, a few weeks ago, I got a presidential pardon from Trump, and that was just exhilarating because, awesome. like you say, it lifted the felon label off of my back, and the left had been able to sort of fling that accusation on me, even though this was clearly a political hit. And what I mean is, yes, I exceeded the campaign finance law, but normally this is an offense that's not even prosecuted when it doesn't involve any corruption. But in my case, Obama and Eric Holder unleashed the full power of the federal government against me. Now, you know, my case is is, is symptomatic of a larger problem, which is that the Democrats have become kind of gangsterized since Obama. And what I mean by that is that they use the weapons of the state against political adversaries. Now, this effort on the left to merge the party and the state, this is pure fascism. This is what Mussolini did in the 20s. This is what Hitler did in the 1930s. They took the Nazi party, and they essentially said, this Nazi party is the the German government. There's no distinction between the two. And that's what the Democrats are trying to achieve in the United States. I mean, there's so many things. And and I I will mention, by the way, that that the the quote-unquote crime you were accused of was donating money to a friend as far as everything I've ever read, it was done accidentally. And so the, the felony label, especially 
the irony of that happening under the Obama administration with Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State is not lost on me. And I got to ask you, what did you think about, uh, given what you just said, they've weaponized our Department of Justice, they've weaponized the FBI. What did you think of the Peter Strzok testimony? Because I, I found it to be scary. I mean, what's, what is so bizarre is, look, we've had governmental abuses of power before, right? But not in this way. I mean, consider J. Edgar Hoover. He had secret right. tapes of Martin Luther King, and he did this and he did that. But J. Edgar Hoover would never dream of putting his thumb on the scale on this side or that of a presidential election. I think he was sufficiently an American patriot to realize you don't muck around with the democratic process like that. That's not the job of the FBI to make sure that Trump gets defeated and Hillary gets elected. So the fact that these top officials of, of a federal agency are trying to rig an election, by the way, after the DNC already rigged the Hillary Bernie primary, I mean, this is deeply scary. Um, this is the kind of thing that actually perverts and poisons the process. And these are the people that accuse Trump of doing it. The movie's called Death of a Nation. I'm talking with a man who's made books and movies over in, in the last decade has opened, I think, a nation's eyes to uh, to, to a, a level of corruption that I don't think any of us ever dreamed possible. What do liberals believe a progressive or socialism is? Because they clearly don't understand it. Because if they understood it, they wouldn't be voting for it. Ocasio-Cortez is the latest example of, of politics gone off the rails. But I, I, I argue, let her speak. Every time she opens her mouth, a new conservative voter is born. Well, the ordinary Democrat does not understand and is, in a sense, being conned by a democratic um, political class um, that does know what's going on. The reason that the people at the top uh, promote socialism is because it's a system that puts them in charge. It gives them power. And uh, I use the analogy of the democratic plantation because while the Democrats used to run slave plantations, today they run this sort of multicultural plantation ghettos for blacks and barrios for Latinos and reservations for Native Americans. But there's a whole class of people that I call the overseers. These are the people who run the plantation. They benefit from it, just like the old slave owners benefited from the plantation. And so in, they are the deeply corrupt people that are conning the rank and file Democrats because they use the language of social justice. Oh, we're doing this for society, kind of in the way that the old slave owner said, oh, no, 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 we're not doing slavery to steal the labor of other people. We're doing it because it's really good for the slave. It's a school yeah. of civilization. So these, these rationales for oppression are very, very old, as Abraham Lincoln recognized 150 years ago. I keep wondering, and, and I guess the question, after I watched a couple different of your movies, uh, especially Hillary's America, the question I had was, why would we need a civil rights march in 1960 if the Constitution was amended in 1870 to give everybody the same rights? What happened in that, that 90 year period that those, those laws weren't enforced and, and enacted? They, and, and they are, they, <laughs> right. So you're putting your finger on, on a taboo, which is that, yes, there were really two civil rights movements. The original civil rights movement was entirely done by the, by the Republican Party over the opposition of the Democratic Party, and that's the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Now, after Reconstruction, the Democratic Party killed those amendments, at least in terms of their enforcement. So the, uh, the 15th Amendment gives blacks the right to vote, but blacks, in effect, had no right to vote, especially in the South. Uh, the 14th Amendment gives blacks equal rights under the law, but those were turned into a dead letter by the Democratic Party. Uh, so uh, that's why for 80 years after the original civil rights movement, uh, you needed another civil rights movement. Again, that second civil rights movement also made possible by the Republican Party. Uh, the opposition to the civil rights movement of the 60s, many people don't know, came from the Democratic and not from the Republican Party. So all of this has been swept under the rug. We're getting a sort of distorted spin on history and what's powerful, I think, about the book and the movie, it's like a one-two punch. I mean, the book has all the footnotes, the citations, it has all the references, and the movie dramatizes it, visualizes it. It's a, just a riveting emotional experience. We showed it last night in a red carpet premiere in Washington, D.C., which was hosted by Donald Trump Jr., and people were super fired up, standing ovation at the end, because I think people realize this is a very eye-opening movie. People like you and people like Mark Levin should be the people teaching in our schools because 
the history these kids are coming out with uh, a knowledge of it, what little history they are coming out is is not correct it's it's lies it's it's propaganda it's Saul Alinsky personified listen Dinesh I can't thank you enough I know you're swamped uh, the movie's called Death of a Nation, guys. It comes out August 3rd. Uh, I can't emphasize uh, uh, or stress enough that it's something you need to do, Dinesh. I'd love to have you back. You take care of yourself. God bless, and thank you. Love to do it. If I can say, just deathofanationmovie.com. That's the website, deathofanationmovie.com. Awesome. We'll keep pushing it here, Dinesh. Take care, buddy. Thank you. Breitbart News Tonight with Joel Pollack and Rebecca Mansour. The real thing that the left is angry about is they're like, how could you allow these Russian memes? Somebody saw a meme and then they decided they had to vote for Trump. Or it must have been fake news. And by fake news, they mean conservative websites. Come on. But this is what the left thinks. Fake news. And by fake news, what they mean is shut down Breitbart. Breitbart News Tonight. Weeknights, starting at 9 p.m. East on Sirius XM Patriot 120. We want to hear from you. Tweet the show at Garrick38. Once again, here's Gert Schilling. Welcome back, and I appreciate my next guest. He is the president and CEO of the First Liberty Institute, which is the nation's largest law firm devoted to protecting religious liberty of all Americans. Uh, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but yesterday at the Department of Justice Religious Liberty Summit, Jeff Sessions announced the creation of the Religious Liberty Task Force, which will further uh, the DOJ's work to protect and promote religious liberty. He is Kelly Shackelford. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good. Great to be on. I, I don't think a lot of people understand the aggression, not just in this country, but worldwide to Christianity. Some of the stories I've seen coming out of our armed, armed forces have been somewhat shocking to me. But talk to me about what the uh, the task force means. And, and But first of all, what what is the, the First Liberty Institute all about? Well, obviously, I think people know around the world. I mean, I mean, ISIS was beheading Christians. I mean, the, the persecution and really murder of people of faith around the world is at an all-time high. But uh, what the task force is focused on is, is really more on where our focus is at First Liberty Institute, which is the United States. Our, our mission is really protecting religious freedom throughout the U.S. US. By the way, if people worry about that, there's well, really not going on there. Then they're kind of not clued into what's happening. We've, I've been doing this for 29 years, and the, the level of attacks going on across the country are just unprecedented. We we collect them every year in a survey we call Undeniable, where we just list and cite all the attacks going on in our country. And people can get it online, just look at it for free and see. It's just page after page after page. I mean, it's so thick, it's you can barely hold the entire book in your hand. Um, right. and, uh, and so this task force is really a follow-up, because what you had is the president, when he was elected, uh, passed an executive order on religious freedom. Part of his executive order was for the attorney general to pass some guidelines uh, to help make sure that there was religious freedom throughout the federal government and all the departments and agencies. And he did that. And they were really excellent. Best I've ever seen. Uh, That was in October. The problem is people have to follow those guidelines. And, uh, you know, we're we're having lots of problems. And, you know, my, my statement was, you know, General Mattis evidently didn't get the memo because the, the people we're having to protect, for instance, in the military is just outrageous. Chaplains being attacked for being chaplains. You know, they're supposed to be people of faith uh, and these types of things. And I can give you examples of those if we have time. But And so this task force is the first time ever within the Department of Justice, the top lawyers have put together a team. Their job is going to be to make sure that these religious liberty guidelines and protections are really implemented and followed throughout the federal government so that religious discrimination and those types of things don't happen and that they have all the agencies and departments, including the military, have the assistance they need to follow the Constitution. You know what? I I would actually like to to hear, if you could, a couple examples, because I don't think people really think this is a thing. Uh, And I've read and researched and understand it's happening a lot more frequently than people know, and it's, it's blatant. Yeah, I'll give you two. Uh, and again, we, we operate in all kinds of areas, uh, religious liberty in the schools, for your churches and religious organizations, in the military, throughout the public arena. But let me start, since we mentioned uh, this, let's start with the military, just give you a couple of examples. 
Um, one is the Chaplain Squires case. And by the way, if you question, if anybody questions anything, then go to firstliberty.org. We have the legal documents there. You can look at everything yourself, look for yourself. You don't have to believe what I'm saying, but I promise you it's true. Chaplain right. Squires is a guy who, who was awarded the Bronze Star, uh, was awarded the Meritorious Service Award five times. This is a great guy that served our country and a great chaplain. And what he did is he followed all the regulations. He is a, the way chaplains work is they um, are supposed to have to be connected to what's called an endorsing group, which is really your denomination. Um, right. And his denomination is essentially the, the Southern Baptist. And one of the requirements in the Army is that you follow the requirements, the beliefs of your endorsing group, your denomination. And, uh, of course, in Southern Baptist, a marriage is a man and a woman. And so one of the requirements for a chaplain would be not to marry or to uh, uh, do a marriage counseling for uh, a same-sex marriage. That would actually violate their beliefs and their faith. So what the regulations say in the Army is if, if somebody were to approach you, for instance, and say, hey, I'd like some marriage counseling, and it's two women or two men, what you're supposed to do is say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't do that because my faith restricts that, but I'm happy to refer you to another chaplain who doesn't have the restrictions I do. That's exactly what happened with Chaplain Squires. He was doing a marriage conference, and two women approached him about being a part of the conference and getting marriage counseling. And he said, oh, I'm really sorry. I can't because of my denomination, my beliefs, but let me refer you. And he referred them to another chaplain. You think, okay, he followed all the regulations, all the laws, right. everything's good, right? No, they decided still that they were going to, they complained. Um, an investigation was opened. And despite the regulations, the determining officer above him said, I don't care that these regulations are here. It still violates sec sep uh, sexual orientation, discrimination. And this guy's career is now over. And so he is now given faithful service, get, got a bronze star and all these awards, and his whole career is being ruined because he followed the regulations and his yeah. faith. And that, that's an example of what these guys I – mean, they're already given everything for us. The idea that right. then they get persecuted and they don't have any religious freedom would be outrageous. Well, and you know, for following the rules. I mean we've seen – what this uh, the swamp has done to to General Flynn uh, and, and other members. Of, well, and you look at what uh, the prior to the Trump administration, the lack of respect shown our armed forces by previous administrations makes my stomach turn. But when Absolutely. you when you say when you say uh, uh, Christian oppression, uh, I think the left has turned that into white people. And when you say it's just mind boggling to me how the, the left has managed to kind of hijack the English language and make you appear to be somehow a racist or a, a uh, you know, anybody practicing religion is is chastised if that religion is Christianity. And, and well, let, I'm, I give I'm you an saying, example, Kurt, of what we just talked ahead. about that shows it's not true. Chaplain Squires, his assistant. His chaplain's assistant is an African American woman. Okay, right. not not only are they persecuting Chaplain Squires, they are persecuting her. She, yeah. th this couple, came to her first and said, "Hey, we would like to be a part of the marriage count, uh, conference." And she said, "Okay," said, "I will have to check with the chaplain first. And she did. She knew there might be a problem, and it followed through. For saying, "I have to check with the chaplain first." She is under investigation. She has been ruled against as well. And this not only affects her that she's having to go through this, but she is a part of a program where because she's in uh, the Army and doing what she's doing, she, she gets to go to college. Because of this, now her college has been canceled and she can't even go to college. So here's an African-American woman that has done nothing wrong. All yeah. she did is they came to her and she said, sure, let me check with the chaplain. And for that... Her uh, not only her career is now in jeopardy, but her college has been taken away. And so what you're basically saying is a highly decorated United States Armed Forces chaplain and a female a young black woman who is his female assistant are both having their lives ruined because they followed the rules as written, basically. Exactly right. I'll tell you one th that, that affects everybody. Um, go to another case. It's real quick. The Bladensburg Cross, the Bladensburg Veterans Memorial. This is a memorial that's been up for almost a hundred years to, to 
honor the 49 men of Prince George's County, Maryland, right outside of Washington, D.C., yep. who gave their lives. Well, there's now uh, a decision from the Federal Court of Appeals saying after a hun- almost 100 years, we are going to have to tear down this Veterans Memorial because it's a cross. And we're now at the right. United States Supreme Court trying to make sure that this doesn't happen because not only would that be a travesty, but Arlington Cemetery is within that same jurisdiction. So if that is not overturned, they would literally have to go into Arlington and tear down the crosses. So this is the kind of stuff happening and the kind of attacks happening that we would never see in the past. Well, we're having conversations now that we never dreamed of having uh, in the past, whether it be around the First Amendment or the Second Amendment or the Fourth Amendment in public. And we're also watching that seep into our armed forces. And I can I go back to the transgender laws and the and the conversation around this. Listen, it's just science is deemed transgender or dysmorphia or whatever they want to call it, a psychological issue, a psychological disability, which it, which disqualifies you from serving in the armed forces. We've managed to bring our social social justice problems into the armed forces, which is the one place where the job should reign uh, above all else when it comes to priorities. Serving in the armed forces is, a, is about carrying out uh, your mission and doing your duty. And w- we've managed to, since the Obama administration and before that, the, the amount of po- politics that have been injected into the military – uh, to me, is dangerous. When you're talking about changing standards for entry uh, to allow women to be in, you're, you're talking about uh, jeopardizing the physical lives of these people. But now you're also talking about jeopardizing the very thing that gives them the faith to do what they do. And right. I, I say that for this reason, Kelly. We still have people signing up to join our military. God bless them. It feels to me like we're, we're putting a lot of disincentives in front of people of a younger generation to possibly join up and serve in our military. But based on how we treat them while they're in and out. No, no doubt. No doubt about it. Uh, look, uh, you know, this is one of the reasons why we're doing what we're doing. We have a whole division just dedicated to, you know, it's religious freedom is all we do, but we have a whole division devoted just to religious freedom in the military because of what has been happening. And uh, I'll tell you, you know, one of the briefs filed in one of our major cases at the uh, Supreme Court on this was by 12 retired generals. And they said, and they're accurate, they said, look, what we found when we were in the military was not only is religious freedom okay, it's the reason most people joined. And you take away religious freedom, you'll destroy our military, not just because that's why they enter, but because that's what they rely upon. They rely upon their faith when they're in these situations. And if you, that's why we have chaplains uh, available and different things like this, because most people are going to rely upon their faith. They need to talk to people. They need to be open about what they believe. And, and that goes all the way back, by the way, George Washington, first thing he did in the first army is he gave everybody a Bible and he established chaplains because he yeah. got it too. You take that away, you'll have a very ineffective and in fact, I think feckless military. And, uh, and yet that's what people are trying to do. So we're, we're fighting. Good news is we're winning. Um, you know, we're winning all these cases, but we're having to fight more than we ever have before. And uh, we just got to we've got to be diligent. I think things like what you're doing and let people know these things are happening is really important. Uh, I would encourage people that are listening, go to firstliberty.org and look at these and share some of these cases with, with other people so they know. I think if there's enough outrage, we'll start yeah. to turn this thing around. Yeah, we're starting to see a lot of uh, a significant movement uh, outside of the swamp and against uh, the establishment for those very reasons. Let me ask you one more question. Outside of the military, where are you seeing the largest or the biggest or the most significant movement against uh, religious liberties and religious freedoms? You know, it's hard to say. It really is everywhere. Um, I would say the most dangerous I'm seeing is is the attempts to go after it in the workplace. Um, because that's where most people spend most of their waking hours. Right. And if, if they ever get the ability to say, we now have control over your, your, you know, your check and we're telling you what, what we're going to take away your religious freedom. I mean, that's tough for people. Uh, so whether it's a, a your religious employer or, empl- you know, trying to run their business according to their faith or employees that are trying to live out their faith, that's, I think the most dangerous area we're, we're you know, again, we're fighting a bunch of those, we're winning them. Um, But it is really everywhere. I mean, we've got a case at the Supreme Court right now with Coach Kennedy, 
who's a guy who has, and was fired. He's a great coach, was fired. Why? Because after the football game, when they go to the center of the field to meet, he went to a knee for 15 seconds to give thanks to God for the privilege of coaching the young men he got to coach. That's the guy we used to just beg for as a coach. Now he gets fired. And so this is the kind of stuff that's happening. And we're just going to have to fight the, the attempts of these folks to change our culture and our country to something we won't recognize. And I think we'll win. The, the, the Constitution and the history and the heritage of this country are with us. But we're going to have to be willing to stand up. Well, for the first time uh, in a long time, it feels like we are the vocal minority. I mean, it's it's we're, we're being Christianity is somehow being tied to something evil in this country, and that to me shows you how far we've come from a, a, a moral compass perspective. Given that the the action you talked about from from President Washington would not happen today, that would get you put in 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 a military trial. Uh, handing out Bibles. I mean, that, that kind of thing is, is it, well, it's, again, it's a sign of the times and it's not a good thing. So, hey, listen, I would love to have you back, Kelly. I really appreciate you taking your time. No, no, happy to do it. Thanks for getting the word out. Thanks again to Dinesh D'Souza, the movie Death of a Nation, August 3rd. Make sure you check it out. Kelly Shackelford, president and CEO of First Liberty Institute. Go to firstliberty.org. Part of this message you heard it was to spread the awareness. As long as we keep spreading awareness, it's a good thing. I'm going to take a little different angle on winners and losers today. My winner today is going to be none other than Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. For this reason, every day she's given a louder, uh, a bigger microphone and a larger platform. And everything she does and says is uh, nurturing and growing conservative voters. Listen to this quote right here. ICE has to be abolished. And I say that as somebody who's running for one of the top law enforcement jobs in the country was the attorney general of New York, a law professor and an ally of Ocasio-Cortez's. She's a Democratic uh, candidate for House in New York. She has said, basically, this is Ocasio-Cortez's his comment. ICE was born in xenophobia, lie, in a time after 9-11 and has grown up to become a tool of fear and illegality, lie. And as attorney general, I will continue to speak out against ICE. I will prosecute ICE for their criminal acts. This woman's running for the attorney general of New York. Ocasio-Cortez fully endorses and supports this woman running for attorney general, which means she endorses prosecuting law enforcement agents for carrying out and protecting and defending the laws that those people create. Are you kidding me? That's beyond, well, it's just beyond anything. And my loser was very, very easy. Jim Acosta is a puss. I mean, I don't know any, know any other way to put that. Uh, a guy who is working for a group of people that has incited more violence than anybody in the last two years is going to whine like a little baby because people are yelling at him. Uh, remember, again, uh, he is the group of people that have incentivized people to shoot uh, Republican politicians on the softball field. And Black Lives Matter founded on a lie. They, they pushed the narrative, Black Lives Matter which is assassinated police officers. This 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 gentleman, uh, I, I say that very, very tongue-in-cheek gentleman, is the worst of the worst. He is a group of people incentivizing and bringing people to a level of violence that's costing other people their lives. And he doesn't have the guts to admit what he's doing. He's a coward. So anyway, those are winners and losers. Guys, Adam Carolla, tomorrow. Uh, you're not going to want to miss that one. Have a great day. God bless. Catch up tomorrow, guys. I want to actually take a couple of the references to Donald Trump from hip hop. And then we're going to try to see if we can figure out why they like Donald Trump. Jay Z said, I'm at the Trump International. Ask for me. Raekwon said, I'm the black Trump. They are comparing themselves to what he represents his wealth, his achievement, capitalism. Sonny's Corner with Sonny Johnson, Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m. East on Sirius XM Patriot 125.